The Passion History this year that we'll be hearing on the Wednesday evening is from, is from the Gospel of Matthew. And we'll be um, watching the visual Bible version of that. It's a word-for-word -word portrayal. So you'll hear the very text, the very words of Matthew's Gospel from the Bible. And you'll see a visual presentation of, of, um, of that um, shown for us. So we'll watch Matthew chapter 26. The verses are printed for you in your service folder too if you want to see them either now or at the time that you um, are at home. Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or well, there may be a riot among the people. Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of a man known as Simon the leper. A woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste? They asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price. And the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty silver coins. Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Turn to our service folder at the bottom of page 5. We'll join together in the seasonal response. Words from Isaiah 53. Let's join. 
All we, like sheep, have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his wounds we are healed. The next song of praise is in the service folder there, printed for you. in the evenings here, um, pick, a, pick a family member or a friend, okay, got them in mind. Think of things, characteristics about them, along with their personality, maybe you think of things like, I mean, their height, their hair, their style, the things that they're good at. And as you list those, see how often the characteristics aren't essential. You might lose your hair. Some of you have. But your hair doesn't make you who you are. You can cut it. You can lose it. You can color it. Your hair doesn't change, or the loss of it doesn't change your identity or your existence. You may have run super fast when you were 17 years old. I used to do sprints. And then one day came a few years back when we set out a distance across the church line out there, uh, lawn out there. Have we told you this? And, uh, and Simeon and I lined up, the rest of the family looked on, and we raced, and Simeon reached the finish line first. Just by a little. Just by a little. I've lost some of my ability there. You might feel, as you age, that you've lost some of your looks. Wives, here's the chance to rip your husbands in the side and say, yes, I'll be a hit. you. And husbands, take it, you know, because a little good ribbing is is healthy in a relationship. And then deeper than that little bit of fun, think about it. It's true. Well, maybe. But you've lost some ability. You've lost some, some looks. You've lost some hair. But that doesn't change who you are. It doesn't change your identity at all. What defines you isn't that. Husbands, now would be a good time to lean to your wife 
and let her know that she's changed too and only grown in beauty over the years. And if you really feel that way and it's not just sentimentality, then you've, you've lost some other things along the way as you've aged, but you've gained some wisdom. You've gained some wisdom. We people have many characteristics about us that are non-essential. You can lose them. They can be changed, but that doesn't change you. They don't define you. You are still you, with or without them. And here's the point. Here's the point. God is not like that. God is different than us. His characteristics, His, His attributes are essential. Think of it. He is holy. You can't take that characteristic away. If you take away holy, He is not Himself anymore. He is not God. His attributes define Him. He is eternal. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. His characteristics are who He is. So just think about that and then think about what we get to do during this Lenten season as we have this theme. Our God is. And tonight we get to focus on how our God is. He is merciful. Go ahead, Hannah, click for us. The Lord, the Lord overflowing with mercy and truth, maintaining mercy for thousands, forgiving guilt and rebellion and sin, that he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Click one more for us, Hannah. Five-sixth. Five-sixth. What do you think? Five-sixth. Um, five-sixth of completed passes by a quarterback is awesome. It's spectacular, in fact. No one in an NFL season has ever done that. That's over 83%. Um, Drew Brees has come the closest. Any Drew Brees fans? Drew Brees has come the closest. 74.4% completion rating in a season. Uh, if your hitting percentage in volleyball or your batting average in baseball or softball is 0.833, 833, that's unheard of. Um, that means five out of six times at bat you're getting a hit, or five out of six times you're scoring a point for your team in volleyball. Okay, teachers, if you get five, six of the test results correct on your history test, the test answer is correct, how are you doing? You're not A, right? But depending on the grade scale, your average or above, you're certainly not near failing. Now, make the jump, okay? Make the jump. How about when we come to God? How about when we come to what someone holds to be true about God? You might know. You might know. Um, that, that God is, go ahead, Hannah, click first. That God is, and hold that God is eternal, from everlasting to everlasting. There's never been a time where God hasn't been here, and every time will be a time where he hasn't. Check, you got that. Go, go again. God is holy, right? No wrong, no faults, no errors, no mistakes. Check, got that. Go ahead. God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present. There's no place where he isn't. You can't escape from him. There's nothing that he can't do. There's nothing that he doesn't know. Check, check, check. But knowing accurately, five-sixths of the characteristics of God doesn't always mean that you have God at all. If God's mercy is missing. If someone doesn't know what God's mercy is, what God in his mercy has done for us, a person may have the other five-sixths of the characteristics of God that we are going to talk about in these Wednesday evenings and still not know God at all, who the true God is, and what he has done in order to save us. An example. Someone may know that God is holy. We have that up there. But if that person then thinks that they have to, that they're going to do enough good in order to earn God's favor back, they don't have God at all. All they have is a false God then. Hannah, click for us. You who are trying to be declared right with God by the law, by your efforts, are completely separated from Christ. Let that sink in. So, we tonight see the essential nature of God's mercy. And we see how if, if we, you and I, would not have been brought to know God's mercy, we wouldn't really have God at all. So, Give a hallelujah, because God has brought us to know who the true God is and what he and his mercy has done for us. Click for us, Hannah. 
Be gracious to me, God, according to your mercy. Remove my sin and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. That's what it took, his mercy. Even someone who states correctly that God is loving, go for us, hand up to the next verse, God is loving, might not have God at all. Really think that through. Someone may have the correct concept that God is, is loving, and yet not God, have God at all, that the true God can believe in what he has done to save us. Let me give you an example. This is the one I ran into. I heard recently an interview of a present-day NFL superstar, one of the, the top in the league. I'm not going to mention the name so you don't get sidetracked, okay? If you want to know, you have to ask me after the service, and then I'll know if you were listening, too, if you have an interest in this. I'm mentioning the individual superstar status only for this reason, so that we can grasp there are a lot of people hearing this type of description, listening to this kind of message about God. There were over half a million views of the YouTube promo for the, um, the, the podcast, that's what it's called, the podcast of this interview of the NFL athlete. So, and that's not even counting the, the podcast listens. I don't know how you find that. So if you listen to the podcast or the, or the promo on video, you're going to see at the religion section, when they're talking about religion, you'll hear a lot that is an attempt to express Christianity's view. But the individual many times gets it all wrong as far as what the Christian truth is. And what comes out of all that is, there is a total dismissal of the need for Jesus and a total dismissal of, ha of having faith in Jesus as the way to God. So he doesn't know God at all then. Go ahead, Hannah, move one forward for us. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father, does not have the Father, does not have God at all. So with that wider backdrop in view, here's what I want you to do. I want you to chew on just a short little quote from this interview. Go ahead, move one more for us. Here's what he said. I don't know how you can believe in a God who would condemn most of the planet to a fiery hell. What type of loving, sensitive, omnipresent, omnipotent being wants to condemn most of his beautiful creation to a fiery hell at the end of all this? So what I want you to do, first of all, is what do you see in there that's true about God's characteristics? Is he loving? Of course. Is he sensitive? Is he compassionate? Yeah, you bet. You see it all over the place. Is he, he's omnipresent. He's, he's all-powerful as well. And the Lord doesn't take any delight in condemning anyone to hell. Go one more for us. He, he's patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want to condemn most of his beautiful creation to an eternity of fiery hell at the end of all this, right? So would he? Jesus is the one who said, narrow is the way that leads to life. Broad is the way and wide is the gate that leads to destruction and many enter through it. Will it happen? that many will be condemned to hell apart from God? That's God's truth. But here's the thing. That truth does not negate the other truth that God is loving. They both stand as true together. This NFL player undoubtedly has some trouble meshing together how, how God can be loving and at the same time he could condemn sin and punish sinners who still have their sin in, in, in hell. There is an answer, however, but we just can't make up our own answer. If we make up our own answer, we have constructed a false God of our own fashioning and of our own liking. But our God has an answer. Our God is the answer. Think of that. People's struggle sometimes doesn't seem to be as much about denying what's true about us. A person might, might acknowledge the wrongs that, that I've got. But the person, if the person thinks God is going to somehow accept them 
without having sin addressed, with their sin still on their record, without having any punishment or, or penalty for the, the sin and the guilt paid for, what's the issue then? What's the problem with that? They're acknowledging what's true about them, but they're denying what's true about God. God's character. God's character is also, He's absolutely just. That means He can't just sweep sin under the rug. He still sees it. It's still there. It still has to be dealt with. He has to address it. And going at it then from the viewpoint directly of the topic that's before us tonight of God's mercy, that, that Aaron's idea um, also really is a matter of redefining or defining away God's mercy. Even those who think of God as loving and merciful may have a whole mixed up idea of what mercy really is. The problem of trying to have, to claim or demand mercy without a, a payment, without being just and punishing sin, you see the problem? That wipes out any need for Jesus, and it wipes out any need for Jesus' work. So with that in mind, here's one definition for mercy. Go ahead. It's been said, mercy is not getting what you deserve. And that's true. And how is it possible that God, who is completely just, is able to, to give you not what you deserve and still be faithful to his justice? Someone else had to take the punishment. Someone else had to pay the penalty that was required for your sin. Mercy always comes at a cost. The recipient is given what he doesn't deserve. But the giver, the giver has a cost. The giver has to, has to what is it? Is it that they have to give their time? in order to come to the need of the other one? Is it that, that they have to, to pay a price in order to remove the damage done by the other one? That's mercy. And the greatest example of it is, is God's. The greatest example is Jesus. In this Lenten season, we're going to again hear Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, how does this prayer go? He, he prays, if it's possible, for this cup of suffering to be taken from me, let it be so. But you notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't ask for God's justice to be sidestepped. He doesn't. He says, your will be done. In other words, God has to remain just because just is just as defining about God as love is defining of God. The answer to how he can be both of those at the same time and still come to the rescue of sinners like you and me his mercy. And his mercy is seen most fully in Jesus' suffering and saving work for us. Go ahead, click for us one more. This is where it all comes together. We heard at the beginning of our Passion History tonight, Jesus said in verse 2, the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. He didn't deserve that. Why? Because of his mercy. He knew it was coming and he went through it because he knew for God to be just, his sin had to be punished so he would take it in our place so that then he could give to us and give to us what we don't deserve. And he does gift and give to us, to, to all who believe in his work. He gives forgiveness and a right standing with God and an eternity of life with God. For what has he done? He's removed your guilt. And all who trust in him are saying, I don't want to be judged based on my record. I want to be judged based on mercy. I want to be judged based on what Jesus has done for me. Treasure this truth. Treasure this truth of who God is. Merciful. Say what the psalmist, get a few verses here. Say what the psalmist, O Lord, let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand but with you? There is forgiveness. Therefore, you are feared, you are trusted and honored. Go again, or join with the, the writer of Lamentations. This is the reason 
for my hope. By the mercies of the Lord, we are not consumed, for his compassions do not fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Micah, who is God like you? You delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. One more. Yes, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As distant as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. Mercy high as the heavens, wide as the skies, huge as the mountains, deep as the oceans. These just give us a, a taste because who can fully understand how great his mercy is? It's immeasurable. And think of what that means for every instance in your life and, and every single circumstance of life that you face as ones who are, are in Jesus through faith you are a member of God's family his dear child think of what this means for you one more quote for us he acts in mercy to rescue us from our wretched plight as captives to sin, death, and hell as well as he acts day after day in the same mercy to preserve our life and rescue us from a thousand perils, even perils we are not aware of. So when things change in life for you, when your health changes, when your abilities change, no one thing will never change. God will not change. His mercy for you will be active for you, his child, all the time, in all circumstances of life. Dear Christian, rejoice. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Continue our worship by gathering an offering. portion for our service this evening is on page 7. I invite you to join in the bold parts of the Lord's Prayer there. O God, our Father, by your mercy and might, the world turns safely into darkness and returns again to light. We place into your hands our unfinished tasks, our unsolved problems, and our unfulfilled hopes, knowing that only what you bless will prosper. To your great love and protection, we commit each other and all those we love, knowing that you alone are our sure defender. Amen. And you have taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Some closing words of blessing. We'll speak responsibly back and forth. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Peace, peace to those far and near, says the Lord. Peace to this house. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace.
sing a final song of praise for our gathering. Good evening again. Welcome to everybody. We're glad to have our visitors with us. Please do join us again. Let's see, a couple of announcements are in there for that. If you would like to join us again these next Wednesdays, the, the soup and, and supper, I guess it won't always be soup, we'll do different themes, will be at 5.30 if you can make it. If you can't make it, please do come for the service. That's at, that's at 6.30 each night, just like tonight. Um, they'll probably be a little bit shorter, more of a devotional. We don't have the imposition of ashes in the other ones, so they'll probably only be 30 to 40 minutes in length on the next Wednesdays. Um, Sunday morning, 10 o'clock worship. Please join us for that too. Bible hours after that. And then the other things I was supposed to announce tonight, let's see. Um, after people have a chance to usher out, if there are a few of the men can help me move the chairs and stack them, we're going to do um, the homeschool support group here tomorrow. So we'll bring the tables out here. Um, so that'll be after. If you want to, to stay around tonight, still stay around, and maybe you can make your way to the room right behind. We'll put the divider out, and there might just still be desserts. If there are desserts left in the meal, it's always a good time to get them right now. That's what I'm planning to do. So join me back there. Um, we'll have dessert. Um, two other things I think I was supposed to announce. Let's see. Um, one was, um, there you go. I think we exchanged back there. Um, the Oh, yeah, Billy's for Christ. Um, if anybody has a, a grill, broken cane grill, that they would like to, um, to to loan to Builders for Christ the next couple of nights, um, they're going to use ours, but if they have another one, it might make it easier for them. So um, let me know or let Herb or Elwood, Herb, Elwood, you guys know them. Let them know. And then um, the only other thing I had was, Cody, did, did you, if anybody would like to get, we're going get, to get the kitchen input um, for the remodel tomorrow, the building group is going to meet. So if you have any... If you'd like to know a little bit more or would like to give some input then tonight, I think Cody or Tanya has been in on that too. Okay, so um, check with them so that they, you, can, you can know what's going on. I think that's everything. God bless the rest of your week and God bless your Lenten journey leading up to, to Jesus' death and resurrection. Mm -hmm.